Right. All right, great. Well, everybody, uh, thank you so much for joining us at our last CCB Skills Seminar uh, tutorial of this year. Um, uh, if you've been coming consistently, thank you. Um, and if this is your first one, I hope you uh, enjoy it and continue coming. Um, today, we have Jonathan King joining us, who is a UC Berkeley alum, uh, but now he's, he's pursuing his PhD at Carnegie Mellon in a joint program with the University of Pittsburgh, and he's uh, advised by David Coes. Um, and his work is about protein structure prediction, and he's developed this really awesome Python tool called Sidechain Net, which is PyTorch based. So if you came to our VE lecture um, uh, two months ago that talked about PyTorch, maybe you'll recall a little bit of that as he's talking through this. Um, but today he's got a really nice presentation uh, set up for us where we will be learning about the um, protein structure problem or protein structure prediction problem in general, and then also how to use this tool. And I can't say enough nice things about Jonathan. He's a fantastic collaborator and scientist. And I got to know him very well last summer as we co-interned. And I really hope you enjoy uh, this tutorial. So with that being said, uh, Jonathan, please do take it away. Great. Thank you so, so much for that really kind introduction, Matt. And it's, it's great to be here. And thanks to everyone for inviting me. Um, yeah, like Matt said, it, it's definitely exciting to be back at Berkeley, even if it's virtual. Uh, but Today I'm going to talk about uh, what I'm really passionate about in my research, which is protein structure prediction and uh, machine learning. Um, but before we get started, I mentioned this to a few of the participants that were here earlier. Go ahead and um, if you have the CoLab notebooks open, go to file and save a copy in Drive so you have your own copy that you can work with. Um, and after that, go ahead and select a runtime, change runtime type, and use the uh, GPU there. I would like to um, ask everyone once they have that to please run the first cell of code. This will install the um, package that we will. I'm, used to, I'm using too many. I've never had that happen. Okay. I will clear some one time. I think they're complaining that I'm using too much GPU. I won't find it. Hopefully you don't get that message. Okay, I don't have a GPU, but hopefully you do because you're not abusing the collab system. Uh, okay, well, that will download and I would like to um, go ahead and give a brief introduction um, and then we can move on with the tutorial from there. So uh, today I'll start off by talking about a little bit of, of a background in um, protein biology. Also set a timer to keep track. Um, and uh, I'll talk about protein structure prediction, a little bit of like, why it's done and how it's done. And then in the last part of the slides and in um, the tutorial, I'll introduce this tool I've been working on called SideChainNet, which I think should be helpful for people who want to get into this, um, this area of research. It can help you load protein structure data, uh, train machine learning models, and then visualize your predictions. Um, feel free to uh, unmute yourself and um, interrupt me if you have a question or we can take questions at the end as well. And so here's a picture on the top right of um, one of the, the first images of a protein structure that was published in 1958 from John Kendrew. And I just thought it was kind of interesting. You know, um, people have been working on protein structure analysis for many decades now. And here's an updated image that you can download uh, at any time of the same structure. Um, and it, there's a lot of progress being made. Uh, so for all of the computer scientists out there, I'll do a really quick uh, refresher on the basics of protein science. Uh, so we know that uh, information is encoded in DNA sequences, which is transcribed into RNA sequences. And finally, that is translated into sequences of amino acids or protein sequences. And each of these amino acids has um, different chemical properties that give it uh, different behavior and can help shape the uh, each protein. And so they all, all amino acids share this thing called the backbone, which is in gray here for nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen atoms. But the thing that differentiates each side chain are these glowing orbs. I'm sorry, the thing that differentiates each protein uh, amino acid are these side chains, which are the colored orbs here. And the side chains have different chemical uh, components. And these are the things that are interacting with each other uh, to help shape the protein and give it, uh, help it do its function in the cell. 
So another way of looking at proteins and their side chains is, is the following. So here's kind of a cartoon representation of a protein structure. Uh, these coil things are called alpha helices. Um, hidden in the back here is a, a beta sheet, but everything that's hanging off of these uh, large structures, all these little sticks and lines, these are the side chain atoms that are um, pretty important to the protein structure. And here's a chart that summarizes many of the, um, the 20 or 21 common um, amino acid side chains, and they're all organized by their different chemical properties. Um, so as I'm kind of, kind of repeating myself, but uh, I believe that amino acid side chains are really critical to the structure of a protein. And so this is an example of something called a catalytic triad. And so when you have um, several amino acid side chains oriented in this manner, um, it helps a protein like this uh, protease enzyme do its function. And the, its function is really dependent on the very precise orientation of just the side chain atoms in an active site. So this is what gives the protein its function, essentially. And something that's really cool that you can do is if you know what a protein looks like, if you, if you know the 3D shape of the protein and you know where the active site is, um, you could design a drug or a small molecule that could attach itself or bind to the uh, active site to modulate its behavior. Or maybe it binds to another part of the protein so that it doesn't interact with other proteins. And this is a way a lot of people design drugs and it's called structure-based drug discovery. And it's been uh, very successful over the past few decades. But you need to know what the protein looks like. And that's a big problem. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's not that many protein structures that we have that we can look at. So this is, this is a bit of an old chart, but in red, we're looking at the total number of protein structures that are available for download and um, versus the total number of protein sequences that are available in blue. So thanks to the really cheap uh, cost of DNA sequencing, we know, we, we know the uh, protein sequences for uh, far many more protein than we know their structures. And so I looked at the numbers uh, just yesterday and from Uniprot, uh, a database of protein sequences, there are 271 million protein sequences available. Um, but from the PDB, the protein data bank, there are only 177,000 protein structures. And that's a relatively very small number. And actually many of those are uh, kind of duplicates. They're very related to one another. And if you looked at only the unique proteins that are in the protein data bank, the number is closer to 100,000. Um, and so part of the reason for this discrepancy is that the experiment that people do, uh, often called X-ray crystallography or these other methods, is sometimes uh, actually impossible um, for, a pro uh, for, for several proteins just based on the shape of the protein. Um, or in many times it's very, just very difficult in the experiment to produce a protein structure can cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. And so for the last um, several decades, uh, people have been trying to take protein sequence data and use it to predict what protein structures look like. Um, <clears throat> so there's, we could have a whole presentation on all the different methods that people use to predict what a protein looks like given its structure. Um, but here's a couple brief images. Um, on the bottom left, this is called contact, um, contact map prediction where you try to predict which residues are in contact with each other. And that's a bit of a, a simpler problem than predicting the entire shape, but it's very useful. Um, as early as uh, 1990s, people have been using neural networks to predict things about protein structure. Um, but a really common scenario is uh, software like Rosetta, which you may have heard of. Um, Rosetta and some other uh, softwares use uh, kind of like a simulation or optimization and search methods to build up you know, pieces of protein and kind of simulate it and use um, physically relevant energy functions to figure out what the predicted protein structure could look like. But as you can imagine, all that searching and optimization is very expensive and it could take a while to make a prediction for a uh, protein structure. Um, but in the last 10 years, uh, deep learning has made huge advancements, not only for things like computer vision um, and natural language processing, but also for, uh, for protein science. And so um, you know, maybe deep learning is the silver bullet, so to speak. You know, we have more data available than ever before. It's still not that much, but there's, there's definitely a lot of um, data that's becoming available. 
Uh, the second thing that makes deep learning attractive for this is that um, once you train the deep learning model, uh, it's extremely fast to make a prediction for it. So where the Rosetta can take a really long time, maybe you can make a prediction with a machine learning model in like less than a second. And that's really attractive. And the third thing, which I kind of alluded to, um, is the fact that natural language processing techniques in particular have made really amazing advancements in just the last few years. So, um, for instance, this is a transformer model, which I'm showing on the right, which was published in 2017. Um, and since it's published, it has been published, uh, transformer models have been widely successful across many areas of machine learning. That's kind of one of the best ways to operate on sequence data, like languages or proteins. Now, you may have, may have seen some uh, articles about fake news being generated, and those were generated with enormous transformers in the GPT-3 model. And um, many, many people have realized that uh, sequences like DNA and proteins, these are kind of like their own language. And you can directly take the methods that people have been using um, at Google and other companies uh, or in academia and you can, for words, and you can apply that directly to proteins. And so um, hopefully uh, some of you have heard about um, a recent development as early as December of last year. Um, called AlphaFold. And so a company named DeepMind, which is uh, owned by Google, I believe, um, for the, the last two uh, biannual protein structure prediction contests, um, so that happening every two years, so, so in December, they participated in one, and two years before that, they also participated. But this December, they made uh, headlines with how well they performed using their deep learning model for protein structure prediction. They blew everybody out of the water and they've done the best that anyone has ever done on this competition for predicting protein structures. And um, there was a lot of uh, you know, articles and blogs. They're kind of patting themselves on the back, right, rightfully so, but um, they were saying that they solved the protein structure prediction problem. And that might be a, a little bit too big of, of a statement perhaps, but they've definitely made tremendous progress and it's, it's really exciting. I don't have time to talk about the detail of their model here. And also it's not completely published. So nobody knows the complete details of the model. Um, but one thing that stuck out to me personally and that I hope sticks out to other people in the field is that um, their model in some shape or form was also predicting the side chain components of the protein, which I'm hopefully beating you over the head that I think that these are really critical for predicting protein structures. Um, most of the methods that participate in these contests every two years don't predict the side chains directly. They predict the backbone and they use an optimization method to put the side chains in. But if you have a model that predicts the side chains, that could be really advantageous. And also, I, I just want to give a shout out to um, a couple really great uh, students and authors at UC Berkeley who have done really um, amazing things with transformers and other language models for protein science. And I think it's really fantastic. So, um, with that being said, you know, like, wh where are we now with? Uh, machine learning and protein science is, well, one, protein science and machine learning is definitely having a moment. It's really exciting. There's lots of advancements. Some people said they solved the entire thing, um, but still we don't really have uh, one source of uh, data that's like, ready to go. There's not like one, just one competition for people who want to use machine learning. Uh, we don't really have our image net, so to speak. Um, another thing is that uh, protein structure data is actually kind of off. It's definitely available and accessible, but there's not that much of it. And there's so many problems with structure data that I, I would say you kind of need a structural biologist sitting next to you to help you work out all the kinks. There's things that are missing atoms. There's things that are really bad quality, things that are like mere images of each other and are only like, they maybe just marked that they're the, the stereoisomer of amino acids. It's really tricky. Um, so you can't just throw machine learning at it, per se. Uh, third, all atom structures, I would argue, are very important, and they're becoming increasingly relevant. Uh, uh, AlphaFold is now predicting all atom protein structure predictions. But if you're going to want to get into this space, and you're, if you want to build a model, you're going to need to deal with the data. And that's like the biggest barrier for activation, or the biggest activation energy barrier that you need to get over in order to start working with this. And that, was kind of where, where I started to do. So in today's tutorial, I'll hopefully 
uh, teach people how to get started with constructor prediction using Python and PyTorch. And we'll talk about the data, and we'll talk about the model. So the data. Um, Okay, so you could just go to the database and download all of the protein structures and the sequences and randomly split them between training sets and testing sets and call it a day. But there's so much similarity between, like I said, between all the proteins in the database that if you just randomly split them, it would be really ineffective to train a machine learning model. And so Mohammed al Karashi, a, a researcher in 2019, developed a data set called Protein Map. And Mohammed looked at the competitions that happen every two years that Google participated in. And he said, wait, the way that they, that they set these up is like perfect for how people do machine learning. And the way that it works is, you know, they have a meeting in December every two years and they say, okay, make your models and develop your methods using whatever proteins you want. But we're going to keep a set, a test set that nobody's seen before that's really difficult and we're not going to let you see it until the competition. And so this is exactly what you want for a machine learning uh, data set. You want the test set to be hard and to have nothing in common with the training set. And so they do this every two years. But the other thing that Muhammad did was that he helped you make um, validation sets. And so, you know, when you're training, you don't want to look at the test set at the very end. So you, he made several validation sets that would have really high similarity and really low similarity to your training set. So you, as you're training, you can say, oh, how well am I doing on similar proteins? Or how well am I doing on dissimilar proteins? Uh, so that's, that's ProteinNet. And ProteinNet is, is really fantastic. But um, for me to use it in my work, I wanted to add some features to it. For instance, it only had the protein background information. Um, also, uh, it wasn't super accessible with Python, and that's why I was using it. So I ended up making this tool that I'll share with you today, and hopefully it will lower the activation energy barrier for people to get started. So SciChainNet is both a data set of all atom protein structure data and contains tools for using that data to make predictions and look at them. Okay, so that's what that's the data that we're going to use today. And the model we're going to use today um, is I'm going to uh, make uh, a simple version of what I would use in my research. So the model we're going to use today is inspired by language um, technologies, and in particular, uh, machine translation. So instead of translating from English to Korean, for instance, we're going to use um, a neural network to translate from protein sequences with amino acid sequences here to vectors of angles. And these angles can describe how each um, side chain and amino acid is oriented in 3D space. So we can use one at a time. Um, the uh, amino acids, we can take them in and predict their, uh, their angle vectors. And once we have all the angle vectors, we can uh, put them together and use an algorithm to uh, take the angles one by one and build up the 3D structure of our protein. Once we have the protein structure, we compare it with the true structure. Um, but th that step is very computationally expensive to convert from angles and build them all up to its coordinates. So another thing you can do is you can compare the protein ang predicted angles with the true angles. And that's what we're going to focus on today. All right, so you might be wondering, you know, what is the neural network actually if we looked inside this blue box? And the neural network we're going to use today, we could use transformers, but a, a simpler version would be to use something called a recurrent neural network or an RNN. So a recurrent neural network is, as the name implies, has some recurrence or repetition to it. Um, these are neural networks that uh, are really good for operating on sequential data. So for, you can imagine here we have an input sequence a protein sequence, and we have an output sequence uh, angles. And um, I'm going to, we can open up the black box or the green box in this case a little bit. And if you haven't seen this before, I don't want it to be too overwhelming, but if you have seen it, that's great. I'll just point out generally how this works. So this line here is called the uh, cell state or the hidden state. And it kind of has the memory of the network as it looks at over all its input. Then there's three basic parts. Um, there's the, this part where it decides what, what part of my memory am I allowed to forget for every time step? You know, what, what part, what information can I throw away? The second thing it does is it says, what part of my input vector do I care about that I want to add to my memory? And the last thing it does is it says, okay, I have this thing in my memory. I've observed this sequence. What am I going to output or emit for this amino acid? So you go all the way from the amino acid to the angle vector is here. That's more or less um, 
how this will work. And this is an example of a long short-term memory network, which is the kind of return we'll have. Okay, so now we can go ahead and continue with our uh, demonstration. Um, okay, so in the demonstration, I'll first go over some uh, basics, then we'll look at our data and we'll train them all. All right, we'll see how we're doing on time here. Okay, so um, by now the data should have been uh, installed and downloaded. Um, so see here when we call it, uh, d equals sidechain net dot load, um, we're loading a debug data set, which is a very small version of a data set which we, we can use interactively. Um, and I've also loaded uh, one version of the data set that is kind of like a real version. So this comes from the cast contest number 12. And at thinning equals 30, this means that this is a downsampled version of the data set. So that the proteins have maximum 30% uh, sequence similarity. So I, I've downloaded that as well, but we're going to start by looking at the debug data set. So by default, SiteChainNet loads the data as a Python dictionary. And you can see at the top level, it's organized by the data set splits that I was talking about. So there's a train, a validation 10, about you know, all the validation sets, the test set. And within each um, data set split, there's all the information. So we have uh, sequences, angles, coordinates, um, evolutionary information like PSSNs that I'll talk about later. There's secondary structure information, uh, X-ray crystallographic resolution information, as well as the protein identifier. So if we look at the training uh, dictionary of our data set here, we can see it has these keys available for use. We also have um, various uh, like metadata that describes the data, like the average of the angles, or the number of proteins, et cetera. Um, there's lots of different ways to load the data if you don't want a Python dictionary. Um, for instance, <clears throat> if you call scn.load with a question mark, it will bring up this handy um, documentation with all the different nuts and bolts. Um, feel free to look at that, uh, but I'll describe the parts that I think are important. Okay, so if you, you can load the data as a Python dictionary and do whatever you would like with it. Um, or if you want to use this data for training a machine learning model, then um, you might want to load it with something called a PyTorch data loader. And a data loader is basically like a wrapper over the Python dictionary that makes training easier. Like it puts everything together in single matrix or tor torch tensor, as it's called, um, and also pads the information so it's all ready to to be fed right into your machine learning model. So we're gonna run a debug, a, the load step on the debug um, data set once again, but this time we're loading it as a data loader with a batch size of four. Uh, quick, um, you can see question. that there are actually many. Oh yeah. Uh, what do you mean by, by pads, by, by pads? It... Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the proteins all have different lengths. So if we were to take the protein sequences and pass them into our model, and we wanted to pass in multiple proteins at the same time, you would have to add padding to the shorter protein sequences so that they're all the same shape. Thanks. Um, so here I've, I've loaded uh, the debug data set and it actually loads many different data loaders. So there's the training set data loader, the test set data loader, all these validation set data loaders. But there's also something called train eval. And for instance, this might be a problem that you come across is that if you're trying to train machine learning models on protein sequences, it can take a really long time to train a model, like a really long time. And so if you wanna see how well your model is performing on your training set, you might not want to evaluate it on the entire training set because that could take a really long time. So the train eval is a smaller version of train, which is just used to uh, see how well you're doing on the training set. So uh, these are data loaders and each data loader has a corresponding data set. And that's what I'm looking at here. You can see that these are protein data sets that have a different number of proteins in it. Okay, so how do you use a data loader? We've loaded them in D. D is a dictionary that contains our data loaders. D with the key train is the training data loader. And we're going to, um, you can just iterate through them. So we'll iterate and we get this batch variable. And we, when we run this, I'm printing out various properties that are accessible from the batch. So for instance, there are the protein IDs, there are protein sequences and all this other information. I'll just take a second to describe um, what I'm printing here. These are different shapes of the tensors that are provided. 
um, shape are really important to understand. So um, you can see they all have a few things in common. So for instance, the first number is the number of proteins in a batch. Remember we asked for a batch size of four. So there's a four proteins in every batch here. The second number is the length of the proteins in that batch. So there's the length of the proteins here are 255, or at least that's the longest one and anything that's shorter is padded. Um, and then the last dimension, this is the most important, this shows the dimensionality of that sequence element of, of data. So what I mean is um, if you look at sequences, there are 20 uh, standard amino acid sequences that are used inside ChainNet. And so the dimensionality is 20 because it's a, it's a vector of all zeros. And there's a one at the place um, where if it's like an A or an M or an S or so on. Um, so similarly, you know, evolutionary data, I'll talk about it later. This has a shape of 21. Um, there's eight classes of secondary structures so that shape eight. Um, there are 12 angles per amino acid. And then lastly, we have um, all the coordinates necessary for the entire protein structure. And those are Cartesian coordinates. We can also access the extra resolution, which is kind of like the quality. Um, and then finally, there is a variable called seq evosec that has the sequence, evolutionary information, and secondary structure all concatenated together if you just wanted to, to give this directly to your model. All right, so um, that's a simple example of using the data litter. But one, one thing that might happen to you if you want to train machine learning models with proteins is um, like we were just talking about, you know, proteins are, are, are a different sizes and it might not be a good idea to train a model that has a protein of length 10 at the same time that it's training a protein length of 1000. So we added this feature called dynamic batching to sidechain it. And dynamic batching um, puts lots of little proteins together in a batch or very few large proteins. So it tries to um, make the model training more efficient. So that's what we can see here as I'm printing out the shape of each batch. Um, the first dimension again is the batch size. So in the first two batches, there were four proteins. Then there were two proteins and three proteins, depending on the middle number, which is the sequence length. So they all have a relatively similar, similar number of residues in each batch. Okay, so um, I've shown you some numbers and some text on the screen, and this is kind of like looking at our data, but the cool thing about protein science, which my advisor always tells me is that, you know, we're working with 3D structures, you can always make pretty pictures. And so that's what we want to do as well. Um, so here I'm just loading the data as a dictionary again. I'm picking out some of the, the textual and number information. So for instance, here is the protein sequence. Uh, here's its mass, which is just saying in the, in the experimental structure, which um, residues were missing or not, which they're missing quite often. Um, this line is secondary structure. Here's um, a, a brief uh, intro to what angles are there and the coordinates that are there. Um, but like I said, let's look at the 3D structure. And there's two ways that we can look at 3D structures of proteins. One is you can, if you represent the protein as a matrix or tensor of angles, you can use the angles to build them up one by one, like I was talking about, and look at the um, protein in 3D. And that's what the structure builder is doing behind the scenes. It's taking the angles associated with this protein sequence and using them to build a protein structure. Uh, you can, if you have the coordinates for a protein sequence, you can also do the same thing. And here is um, a 3D protein structure generated from the coordinates. Okay, so I wanna make, um, a, a small comment, and that is um, if you're uh, representing a protein structure as a sequence of angles, um, there are some assumptions you have to make in order to generate the structure. So for instance, uh, we didn't write down what the lengths between every single atom were in the structure. So if you just had the angles, you have to make some assumptions about you know, how far apart are these atoms. And there's little details like that that mean that the structure that I'm showing you that was generated from angles and coordinates, they're not perfectly the same. They're really close, but we have to make some assumptions if we're using angles. And so what this cell is doing here is using another package called protein, which is analyzes proteins. And I'm computing the root mean squared deviation between these two sets of coordinates. And so when I generate it from angles and when I generate it from coordinates, I'm showing that there's a small amount of error 
in the structure that was generated with the tickets. But um, usually they say if it's like less than two or less than one, there's nothing to worry about. So um, we'll just keep that in mind. Okay, so another, another really um, useful thing, if you're working with proteins, you'll probably see a PDB file, a protein databank file. Um, this, is, this was like the de facto method for um, downloading protein structures. And so we also have a method to take this information and turn it into a PDB file. Um, so this saves the PDB file and we can use the head functionality to look at the few, first few lines of it. So there's basically one line for every atom. It says what the atom type is, like nitrogen, carbon, and it says what kind of residue it's attached to, some other information, and there's the, um, the Cartesian coordinates there in the middle. Okay, so thank you for staying with me so far. I've gone through some like random bits of functionality that you can use um, with SideChainNet. And you know, let's let's get ready to use this for something um, practical and interesting. Okay, so like I said, we have the data. Um, let's uh, let's take a look and we let's look at some some statistics of our data before we actually uh, make some predictions. This is something that um, is really important to do before you start training. And so this cell is uh, making a, a distribution plot of all this uh, protein sequence length. So there's a large um, range of protein sequence lengths in our data set. Uh, on average, they're 228 residues long. But you know there is one that one protein that's 1,032 residues. So that's something to to keep in mind. Um, another way we can inspect our data is kind of look at the quality of the data. And the quality is um, can be approximated with the uh, X-ray crystallographic resolution. So this is also available for you to look at in SideChainNet. And so here I'm plotting the resolution, our lower is better, of the training set and the validation set. Um, and we can see that most of the time the resolutions hover around two, which is good. Um, but there's a few training set examples that have really high resolution. And sometimes, you know, people will do uh, experiments and they upload the structure and they use a different experimental method or uh, something which is not perfect with it. Um, and they have really poor resolution, basically. So these structures might not be the best to improve, uh, but we'll, we'll worry about that. Okay, we've looked at our data. We've talked about some basic tools that we have for sidechain that. Let's build a model. Um, okay, so I would encourage you to scroll down um, a little bit to the code, and then I'll go up and talk about it. So you can run these steps. These import the training libraries. This initializes the, the model. We load the data once again. Um, we create the model, some housekeeping things. And then finally, to, until you get to this spot, where it says for epoch and range 10. This is the model training code. So go ahead and let that run. And I'm gonna scroll all the way back up um, so that can train while I'm talking about it. Okay, so we're gonna make two versions of a model today. One is going to be uh, working on protein sequence information only, and it's going to predict the angles only. Uh, the second, we're going to try to improve. We're gonna add some information and make the model a little bit better so that the predictions can hopefully be a little bit better. So if you remember this uh, picture from the slides, this is the general overview. We have the input amino acid sequence. We have the output angle sequence. And then there's this part about structure generation, which is important if you want to look at your, pic your structure. But if you remember, I, I said that this is very computationally expensive. So we're only going to predict the angles and compare the predicted angles with the true angles. Okay, And if we wanted to zoom in on the model part again, so I said we're going to use RNNs today or recurrent neural networks. Fortunately, someone has made a paper about doing just this. Um, I, it's another paper by Mohammed al Qureshi. He, he did a really good job. And um, so he made a recurrent neural network that is like us and we're taking in um, amino acid sequences in the bottom. And for every amino acid, he predicted um, three angles that describe the backbone of the protein. We're gonna go a little bit further than that today because we're going to predict all of the angles necessary to build the entire structure. So we're going to predict 12 angles. All right, I, I have a, a little bit more description about our model, um, so please, please bear with me. So one of the things that I 
like to think about when I'm uh, building a model is the shapes of the data and how the size of the data changes from the input to the output. This is important for understanding how the model works. So I've drawn this like an abstract view of how the data looks at each step. So in the first step, we have our input data, which is sequences. So you can re represent this as one hot sequences, which is shown here on the bottom, or you can actually represent them as numbers, which is <clears throat> the simplest way, <clears throat> sorry, as integers. Um, that's a really simple way for PyTorch, and <clears throat> that's what we'll be using for the first part. So this has the dimensionality with, uh, that's related to the number of amino acid characters. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> the next step we're going to do is we're going to embed all of the amino acids into amino acid embeddings. And this is something that's commonly done in natural language processing. So they, they instead of having words with like a one and a giant vector, um, they make word embeddings which summarize the content of the word and how it's related to other words. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're going to embed our amino acid sequences into an embedding dimension. So this will summarize the sequence. The next thing that happens is we're going to take the embedded sequence and we're going to put it through an LSTM. <clears throat> Now the dimensionality of the data is equal to the dimensionality of the hidden state or the memory of the LSTM. Okay, so it goes to the LSTM, it comes out, has the dimensionality of the hidden state. And then the final thing we want is we want predict, to predict angles, right? We, we don't care what the dimensionality of the hidden state is. We need to have the dimensionality of the angles. And so that's where we do a one final projection so that it's in the shape that we want. So um, in a first pass, this is my, what you might think we would want our output to look like. We would have an output tensor or matrix of um, all the angles and 12 angles for every amino acid. But there's a complication that um, could really help us or, or make things difficult. So angles are represented usually between, in radians between negative pi and positive pi. But if you're training a model to predict angles and you're using a loss function like mean squared error, it does not understand that uh, negative pi and positive pi are the exact same angle and they're the exact same point on the uh, unit circle, right? So there's a circularity in angles that's not accounted for if you just train a machine learning model using mean squared error. So there's a trick you can do that comes from si the signal processing community that says if you're trying to predict angles, one thing you can do is take the sine and the cosine of each angle like this. So Instead of having one number for every angle, we only have two numbers for every angle. And you use a function called atan2 that takes these values and returns the original angle. And the good thing about this is that these are not on radians, they're between negative one and positive one, and there's no circularity um, issues to worry about. Negative one and positive one are not the same, they're complete opposites. So we're, not, we're going to predict L by the number of angles, 12 by two. So we're Hopefully everybody is still following, but feel free to interrupt if you have any questions about that. Okay, so um, now I'm going to describe the code of the model. I think your model should probably be done running, but because I was kicked out of using a GPU, I don't think my models are gonna finish running, but I will describe how the model works. Okay, so this is a model uh, we use, we create a model by inheriting from the base uh, module class from torch, torch.nn.module. Um, so as I called it a protein RNN, and I won't talk about the initialization um, or a couple other like housekeeping functions here, but I will talk about the forward method. And this is the method that gets called every time the model gets input. All right, so um, in the forward, we're gonna take in a sequence. And the first thing we do is we have to do a little bit more housekeeping. Um, we initialize the memory or like the hidden state of the, of the LSTM. And we also compute the lengths of every sequence. Uh, next, we take the sequence and we uh, embed it. So this is not something that is always done, but it was just a choice we made for this example model. So we take the sequence and we embed it. Uh, the next step is to pass the sequence into the LSTM. Okay, and the LSTM, unfortunately, um, there you have to call this uh, pack and unpack before and after you call the LSTM. And this is something that you have to do with PyTorch. And um, feel free to ask me 
a question if you want to know how this works, but essentially prepares the data to be input to the LSDN and then kind of unpacks it or de-prepares it afterwards. Okay, so now at this point, our uh, sequence has gone through the LSDN and the dimensionality is equal to the hidden state dimensionality of the LSDN. But we need the output dimensionality to have the um, dimensionality of the angles times two. So I see uh, Robert asked in the chat here, how do you do the embedding? Um, in this case, the embedding layer um, can either be a torch.nn.embedding layer. And this only works if you use integer sequences. Um, but if you don't use integer sequences, you can just use a linear layer, which basically just does a matrix multiplication from the input to the next layer. Okay, so we have the embedding, we have the LSTM, um, we have the output of the LSTM being the dimensionality of the hidden state, then we multiply it by the, um, an output projection, which is another linear layer that converts the output to have dimensionality 24. And then those values are not bounded. They're, they could be whatever the, the neural network wants to um, produce. And so we, as it's very common in machine learning to put your output values through an activation function. So we can use the hyperbolic activation function, sorry, hyperbolic tangent to make sure these values lie between negative one and positive one, which is perfect um, for what we're doing. Okay, um, and then finally, we can reshape the output so that we have the shape being batched by length by a number of angles, 12 by two values, uh, cosine and sine. All right, so we've got everything set up. We've got the um, data set loaded here. You know, you can change from debug to cast version 12, pending 30, if you want. Um, we've initialized the model with um, certain dimensionalities, uh, which you are free to change. Um, and then uh, this is some housekeeping information. And then we have the model training here. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt mine, but yours should be done. Um, and we're going to look at the plot of the batch training loss over time. So here we can see the root mean squared error between the true angles and the predicted angles and it's decreasing over time, which is good. Um, we can also look at the performance of the, um, the models over time uh, after every epoch. Um, and so I'm looking at the train eval set, the valid 10 set, which remember is very dissimilar, and the valid 90 set, which is very similar to the train set. So I think my plot here looks pretty awful because it hardly trained at all without using the GPU, but you should see them um, slowly decrease on your screen. Okay, we've, made, we've trained the model a little bit. Um, now we, I've made this uh, method to help visualize what the structures look like. Um, I use behind the scenes something called a batch structure builder, which can build structures for an entire batch of predictions. And I'm fairly certain mine will not look, oh, you know, that was much better than I anticipated. That was completely random. I thought it was gonna be horrible. This is actually not horrible. Um, so we predicted this small uh, alpha helix here. And um, if we look at the true the true structure, okay, you know, it, it's not the true structure, but it was better than I was expecting. Um, so we've trained a very simple model. Okay, um, I'm gonna continue on. I, I know we don't have a ton of time left, but we can improve this model by adding um, a few things like position-specific scoring matrices, um, using a larger data set, and increasing the size of the model. Um, a position-specific scoring matrix, or PSSM, kind of looks like this. So these pictures are based off of DNA, but the same applies for um, protein sequences. And they basically summarize over all the related protein sequences, uh, how often a certain uh, character is at that position. So this one's always an A, this one's a C or an A, et cetera and it summarizes information. So feel free to run these cells uh, on your own. Um, the only difference is the uh, dimensionality of the model, and um, I would recommend using a larger data set. Um, all the other stuff is exactly the same. But fortunately for us, I've um, trained this model for an hour um, ahead of time, and if you skip down to this section, it will download the model weights, and um, it will load them into the model. Um, I cannot put it on a CUDA. Um, yours should work, but I don't have CUDA. Let's see. 
I hope mine still works. <clears throat> but you should be able to run these cells. Um, I'm actually having trouble doing that, unfortunately. But I think I have a backup. Okay. No, I think I, okay. Unfortunately, the um, some of the visualizations won't be loading on my screen, but on your screen, go ahead and load these cells and you should be able to interact with various predictions of the model. Um, fortunately, I have one here. I just wanna point out that this model, um, the predictions aren't good by any stretch of the imagination. Um, it was only trained for an hour on a small version of the data set, but you can see here that um, there's these like ribbon-like sections of the protein's prediction, and there's one alpha helix in the middle. And if you look at what the true protein should look like, indeed, there is a alpha helix in the middle surrounded by a lot of beta strands. Um, so I would say that's an improvement, but there's a lot of work to still be done. We'll see the question here in the chat. Are you familiar with MSA futurization? And if so, how do you generate them for model training? Um, I'm not very familiar with MSA futurization. Um, so I don't have a great answer for that. <clears throat> the uh, multiple sequence alignments are, are not something that I made. They're something that came from ProteinNet. And then after the MSAs, they are summarized into a PSSM, which just has the, the, um, the, the fractions of how often something appears. So we have access to that data, but um, we don't have the, the raw MSAs are not part of sizing that. Okay, so um, I've talked about uh, some simple models. No, no problem, Arvin. Okay, so I've talked about some simple models and here we won't have time for it, but um, I've, I laid out some code that will go the, the extra step to not only predict um, angles for a protein, but will actually predict coordinates and then use a special loss function called DRNSD to train um, the model between the true, pro the true uh, protein structures and the predicted protein structures. And I will warn you, this will take mu much longer because it's very computationally expensive and Colab doesn't exactly have the right tools for doing this in parallel. Um, but feel free to, to try it out um, and let me know how that goes. Um, I don't have the predictions loaded for that, but um, I, I, that concludes uh, all the topics I was going to share about SciChainNet. Thank you so much for being here with me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. And if you want more information, I put a link to the GitHub for the project. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what, what you and the, the community can do that. I, I hope I've made the activation a little bit lower. So thank you again. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jonathan. That that data set looked like it was a really, really useful tool. And um, hopefully we'll lower the activation energy and um, and people can start building their own models uh, for this task. Um, before we jump into questions, I just wanted to make a really quick note that um, we put together a survey uh, just get an idea of um, how clear the talk was uh, to provide feedback for the speaker, but also to provide feedback to the organization or the organizers um, of what, what we can do better and what topics you want to hear about. So I post that in the uh, chat. You can just fill it out. But um, yeah, that being said, are there any questions? Um, I'm happy to stay on uh, a little bit later as long as Jonathan is, is, is free and we can field any questions people may have. Oh, Arjun, um, let me post the, the website to this chat as well. That's where you can find all of the information. There's uh, the notebook and the slides, and um, we'll also post the video recording there as well. Thank you very much. No problem. You can post questions in the uh, chat or you can unmute yourself. I have a question. Um, so I, I'm not I'm not an expert in the uh, like protein structure community, but has there been a ensemble method been tried to improve the accuracy in predicting protein structure? Yeah, definitely. Um, and there's uh, people have tried so many different methods. Uh, it's just kind of crazy how well Alpha Fold worked at the the last biannual competition. Um, so yeah, people have tried so many different things. Um, like I said, it could be a whole presentation about it, but nobody has gotten it to work as well as they have. And I think maybe some of it has to do with transformers and things like that. Okay, great. 
Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ensemble is probably a really good idea. It probably helps. I know uh, you mentioned that the, the MSA futurization is not something you're super familiar with, but do you happen to know maybe like what direction the person could go to learn more about how those things are generated by chance? Are you are you curious about how the MSAs are generated or? Yeah, I was wondering in terms of like, if you're generating new protein data and you want to be able to futurize it and throw it into one of these models, um, like how would you be able to do that? And so that's why I'm asking about this. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so I believe, so ProteinNet came out before my work. And if you go to ProteinNet's GitHub repository, I believe Mohammed has a description on um, how he generated his data, or at least it's in his paper. And he has the data, he has raw MSA data available for download. Um, but as far as like downstream analyses, like uh, featureization, I, I'm not exactly sure where I could point you. But I think um, AlphaFold was using raw MSAs, I believe. People are starting to, to try to use raw MSAs as input to models because they have a lot of information. Gotcha. Thank you. Welcome. Jonathan, there's another question from Jacob about where the training and validation data is hosted. Yeah, thanks. Um, so a big like part of the work inside Chainnet was like getting it in a in these matrices and available for um, for people to use downstream. So I've pre-processed it and then I am hosting it like on, on box right now. Um, and that's where it gets downloaded from. Um, yeah, it's a little bit tricky because just having a list of proteins and downloading them from the protein data bank, it doesn't solve them. There's so, so many obstacles. So I just reprocessed it. Yeah, you're welcome. Out of curiosity, how big is the, the data set on Box? Is it on the terabyte scale or gigabytes? No, not, not even. It's a, it's a few gigabytes, like five gigabytes maybe for everything. Wow. So you can do that locally. You can have that local on your computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that's a constant hassle and um, constant struggle is like dealing with all these issues that, that break constantly with the protein data bank. Um, so it's not it's not good that I have to pre-process it, but it makes it easier. Can I ask a question? I thought I heard someone ask, uh, if they could yes. ask a question. Yes, yeah. I'd like to. So Jonathan, I am from X. This is a, a, a you know, very informative talk for me. So thanks very much, it was great. Similar to you, I think we currently have an application that is you know, a, a, where the outputs of the AI models that we are using you know, could have a, a, an impact on safety critical applications. So in your case, you're doing protein structure. So in that case, you know, I'm guessing that this could be used for drug discovery or things like that. What is your opinion on our ability to evaluate the output of these AI models. In your case, you are getting a structure. So, you know, we said it's difficult for traditional techniques to do this generation of the structure. So how do we feel about testing, about, you know, relying on, on a method that, that is generating this based on the previous data that it has seen? Yeah, I'm just trying to get your feel on, you know, a, 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 how confident can we feel about using the output of, of these processes that are a little hard to verify? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm, I, I'm not a complete expert on the evaluation of these models either, but um, I have, maybe I can have some, some insight. So one thing that um, I didn't really bring up is the fact that on proteins that we know a lot of similar proteins, so proteins that are very similar to our knowledge already, um, we can do extremely high quality predictions about what they look like. And they have been able to do high quality predictions for these proteins for a while. It's just that over time, we've gotten better at predicting things that we've never seen before. And so those are the biggest advancements. So I think um, a lot of it has to depend with, um, you, your confidence would depend on you know, how dissimilar or similar is your protein to known pro protein structures. Um, and there's several measures of uh, quality um, that they use, like there's one called GDTTS, which is a general quality metric um, that is agnostic to size, I think, or, no, I mean, but it's what they use for the CAS competition. Um, 
but yeah, I think, um, you know, there hasn't been this level of quality before for un previously unseen proteins. So that question is probably something that, you know, a lot of people are asking. Um, another, another comment I would have about that is that, um, you know, in, in their presentation and uh, the AlphaFold team said, you know, we, we can make predictions for structures with an RMSD, root mean squared deviation, which is like the general purpose um, structure quality metric of like less than, than two or something. And this sounds really good because um, when you compare two structures, an RMSD less than two means they're the same. But this is an RMSD less than two um, when, they're talk, or when they're talking about resolution, uh, this is, is not really the same metric. I think I'm a little hard to explain, but basically when you download a structure from the protein databank and its resolution um, is two, that's not exactly the same thing. Like for instance, if you, if you wanted to design a drug for a protein and you said my RMSD, or you would have to say my RMSD to the true structure is less than 0.02 in order to design a drug for it. Um, so I, I hope that makes sense. Sorry, I got a little bit wrap, wrapped up in my head, but the, there's competing metrics and we're still not at the quality where we can design drugs from uh, predicted structures. The, the um, resolution has to be much higher. I hope I, hope I answered your question some. Yeah, Are there any more uh, questions that people like to ask? Okay. Um, well, that sounds like we'll uh, wrap up. Thank you so much again, Jonathan, for the fantastic tutorial uh, and joining us um, virtually. Um, yeah, we're so thankful. And uh, for those of you who are still on the call, I did link the uh, survey to the chat. So if you can just fill that out, that helps us secure funding, but it also gives us an idea what you want to hear about um, as well. So um, yeah, thank you so much again, and we'll see you next fall for the uh, skills seminar in the fall. Yeah. Thanks, enjoy your summers, everyone. Thanks, Matt. And thanks again for having me. Had a great time. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan.